Welcome to tonight's debate. Election day is coming and every vote matters. Tonight, WAGM, in partnership with the Rustic Partnership and WABI, will introduce you to the four Senate candidates running for Maine's 2nd Congressional District. We will ask the questions you want answered so you can feel confident with your vote on November 3rd. Here are your moderators for tonight's debate, Kelly O'Mara and Jason Parent. All right, well, good evening, and thank you for joining us for our 2020 Senate debate. We are joined this evening by all four candidates running for this Senate seat. We have incumbent Republican Susan Collins, Democrat Sarah Gideon, and two independent candidates, Lisa Savage and Max Lynn. I am joined by Jason Parent, who is representing the Aroostook Partnership. Now, during tonight's debate, each candidate will have one minute to respond to each question we ask. That will then be followed by a 30-second rebuttal time once all candidates have had the opportunity to answer. After a short break in the middle of this debate, we will ask each candidate a specific question. Each candidate will have one minute to answer. We will wrap up with a few more general questions, then each candidate will have a one-minute closing statement. We do ask that candidates answer the questions that are asked. That said, your minute is your minute. Please contain your answer to that time given, though. If you need to finish a thought, that is fine. However, if you continue past your time, we will shut off your microphone and move on in an effort to get as many questions asked and answered as time will allow. We thank you for helping us with this. All right, Kelly, we now start with the first question. That's right. Uh, News Director John Small from WABI will be asking it, and we'll be beginning, once he asks it, with Senator Susan Collins. Thank you, Jason and Kelly, and thank you to the candidates for joining us tonight, and uh, welcome from a socially distant Bangor. Our first question tonight concerns the Supreme Court. Saturday, President Trump put forward his nomination for the Supreme Court. It seems nominations to the Supreme Court become more and more contentious each time. Now, moving forward, some have suggested reforms like term limits for justices and more justices on the court. What, if any, reforms would you support or propose to lessen the political rancor surrounding any future nominations? Senator Collins? Good evening. And thank you for hosting this debate tonight. I think one of the worst ideas for trying to make the Supreme Court less political is to pack the court. As the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, nine is a good number. It's the number of justices that we've had since 1869. It would make the court a political organization, which the framers of the Constitution never intended if we were to expand the size. What we need to do is to make the confirmation process less political, more respectful, and more insightful. But it would be a terrible idea to have either term limits which would diminish the independence of the court or to increase the size. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Gideon. Thank you very much for that question and good evening everyone. Thank you for tuning in. First, I want to recognize that the loss of Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a loss to all of us. And in fact, she was a giant who made such strides on women's rights and gender equality. Her vacancy should not be filled until both a new president and a new Senate are seated. But I want to be clear about the place that we're in right now and why we are there. Senator Susan Collins has voted during Donald Trump's first two years of his presidency for every single judicial nominee that Mitch McConnell put forward. And totaling, as of today, 181 judicial nominees that has pushed the Supreme Court far to the right and made it very ideological. What we have to focus on is how we get back to a judiciary that is independent once again. Now we're in the middle of a pandemic and one week after election day, we are going to see the Supreme Court pick up the Affordable Care Act and take potentially health care away from Americans. We need to do better. Thank you very much. Max Lynn? Uh, yes, I'm the only one up here uh, supporting President Trump, number one, and number two, supporting his appointment. This happens with all administrations. We know that. We saw it with Barack Obama when he appointed someone the Republicans complained. I would have supported that nominee. I always support the president's nominee. What we have with Sarah and Susan is just a show. For example, you don't know it, but Sarah's on a eight-foot plank up, so she looks taller. And we all know that we're looking for justice. I wouldn't extend the number of Supreme Courts, but I think there should maybe be an age limit on the Supreme Courts. 
because the constitution of what's important. And talking about COVID, it's a very big issue right now. COVID is a serious enough where people should be aware that they need to wear masks, but the level of government intrusion has gone too far. So I want to publicly take these masks right now and make a protest against the government and cut these masks. Too much government intrusion is not what we need. Okay, thank you very much. Lisa Savage. Thank you for being here. Thank you, audience. And thank you for the question. Well, I do think that the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a, an enormous event in our political life. As we know, the Supreme Court was intended to be a check on both the legislative and the executive branches of government, and it's a very important structure in our Constitution. I do favor term limits for the Supreme Court. That is a reform that would make sense. When the Supreme Court was uh, created with lifetime appointments, the average lifespan of Americans was 39 years old. It's now 79 years old. I think we should take that into account. It's also possible that we might look at expanding the court, but impaneling nine justices to hear any given case. I think that would warrant more study, but that's certainly an idea that we should think about. I definitely think we should not rush into um, confirming someone right now. Election season is actually underway. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the rebuttal period for that Bye. question. Senator Collins. First of all, let me point out that Sarah once again did not truthfully state what has happened. I have opposed some of President Trump's judicial nominees including ones backed by Mitch McConnell, including a judge nominee from Mitch McConnell's home state of Kentucky. By contrast, Sarah's refused to rule out packing the court. She said, well, maybe I'm skeptical of it, but maybe we'll have to do it. That we'd like Thank to you. know. Thank you, Senator Collins. Sarah Gideon, your 30 seconds on that question. Thank you very much. Let's be clear. What I said was that in the first two years of President Trump's can, uh, presidency, Senator Collins voted for every single nominee, totaling 181 today. Now, in terms of reforms to the court, what I want to see is a judiciary that is returned to an independent judiciary. And the way I see to do that, I do not see any of the proposals coming forward doing that. I see that being a constant partisan battle. What I think we need are judicial nominees that do not have a political Thank agenda. You. Thank you, Sarah Gideon. Max Lynn, would you like 30 seconds to rebut on this question? Uh, yes. Uh, I want all the viewers to realize that, really, Sarah is not running against Susan, and Susan's not running against Sarah. They're just the faceplates of the monolithic, huge, giant Republican and Democratic Party. What these women say up here tonight really have no meaning, no consequence. Because if Sarah wins, all the power goes to Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. That's who you're voting for. And the voting for Susan just goes to Mitch McConnell. More of the same is all you're going to get. The only change vote here is right here as your independent candidate. And Lisa Savage, you get the last word on this one. Yes, well, the Senate Majority Leader left a vacancy on the court for nearly a year when President Obama was in office, uh, failing to hold hearings for his nominee, Merrick Garland. I don't see how rushing a nominee in the last six weeks uh, before the election is held <coughs> could really be justified in the context of uh, what happened the last time there was a vacancy on the Supreme Court. All right, thank you, candidates. We're going to pivot now to our second question, and for that, we're going to go to WAGM's Ashley Blackford. Now, a lot has been said about government's management of the pandemic so far. We, of course, want to look forward, not back. So from here on out, what would you like to see happen? What are we doing right? And what would you like to see improved? And it goes first to Sarah Gideon. Thank you for that question, Ashley. Yes, we have now lost more than 200,000 American lives during COVID and our economy is in shambles. We have to focus on what we need to do moving forward. I'm proud of what we did here in Maine, bringing Republicans, independents, and Democrats together to act swiftly. And as a result, we have one of the lowest COVID-19 uh, incidences and infection rates in the entire country. But in Washington, we have seen Susan Collins come home once again from Washington without having passed any additional coronavirus relief. We have families waiting, and here's what we need to do. In the short term, we need more help for first responders. We need PPE tests 
testing and the ability to uh, put a vaccine out when it is ready. In the long term, we need an investment in our economy and recovery. But I want to say this. Senator Collins talks often about seniority. She talks about the value of being in Washington 24 years. But whether it's protecting pre-existing conditions, bringing down the cost of pres prescription drugs, or bringing more COVID relief home, she Thank has you. not been able to do it. And that seniority does not seem to matter you, for Sarah. Mainers. Thank you, Sarah Gideon. Max Lynn, your minute on this question. Uh, thank you. Well, again, I come back to I respect everybody who wants to wear a mask. I respect businesses who want to wear a mask. But businesses and people should make the choices. As I said at my opening, what we have here is way too much government overreach. And so, again, symbolically, I want to cut these masks right in front of our viewers. I want to be the first Senate candidate and your first senator in the United States to say, I protest government telling us what we have to wear and telling us what our businesses are necessary and what are unnecessary. This is a encroachment on our Constitution and our Bill of Rights and it must stop. And this over here, as I see Sarah and Susan continue their answers, it's most ridiculous. We know with a Sarah in Washington, you're going to have defunding the police, you're going to have mandatory vaccines and mandatory lockdowns because that's what Nancy and Chuck want. And a victory with Sarah or Susan does just that. Thank you, Max Lynn. Lisa Savage, your minute on this question. Yes, well, I think the greatest failing under the pandemic has been the failure to institute universal health care. I am the only candidate here supporting Medicare for all, single payer universal health care in a public health crisis. Uh, during when the pandemic hit, one nearly one in four Maine workers lost their jobs and many of them lost their health care at the same time. That is not fair. We need to take care of people. And when Mainers are polled about what is your biggest concern right now, they say health care consistently. They want Medicare for all, and yet the corporate interests that profit from for-profit health care um, are blocking it. And it, uh, if people want Medicare for all, under ranked choice voting, they should rank me first because I am the candidate that will fight for that. They can take another, uh, rank another candidate second as their safety pick. But if they want Medicare for all, I am their candidate. And that is what we need to do uh, to deal with this pandemic. Thank you, Lisa Savage. Senator Collins, your minute on this question. Sarah may have missed it, but in fact, Congress has passed unanimously three coronavirus bills, including one that provided $3 trillion to deal with the pandemic. It included the Paycheck Protection Program, which I authored, which has helped sustain 250,000 jobs in this state. By contrast, Sarah adjourned the legislature on March 17th hasn't lifted a finger to do anything Thank about you. the coronavirus. Thank you. Promised to provide Thank aid to small business, Senator. but did not do so. Thank you, Senator. That was a minute plus. Now we'll move on to uh, Sarah Gideon for her 30 second rebuttal. Thank you very much for that opportunity. Uh, Max said a number of things that are just patently untrue. And in response to what we did here in Maine, Look, Republicans, Democrats, and independents came together incredibly swiftly to take action. We also, as I said, have seen one of the lowest COVID-19 rates in the entire nation. We have given aid to schools, made sure that children continue to have nutritious meals, and we have actually instituted small business grants that are available. We need more help from the federal government, for state, Thank for local government, and for Thank our families, and we need it now. Thank you, Sarah Gideon. Max Lynn, your Thank 30 you. seconds. Thank you. Again, the circus continues with Sarah and Susan. I knew Susan would bring up the PPP again. I have a list here of hundreds of uh, listed corporations that got PPC money. From the top, the hospitality company here, 126 million. Uh, Ruth Chris Auto Nation, 80 million. We know now, we can look on the internet and see that all the fraud that has happened with this and the abuse, it has not been the way and it has bailed out the big corporations. Thank you, Max Lynn. Lisa Savage. Yes, I would agree that uh, the next step under the pandemic would be a people's bailout. My campaign has been calling for this for several months. There was one rather small payment to American families. Um, people are struggling with whether to pay the rent or whether to put food on the table, and that is not fair. We uh, have bailed out the corporations, very wealthy corporations, numerous times, but the people 
have yet to get truly meaningful economic relief in this pandemic. Thank you, Senator Collins. The last word on this one is yours. We do need to produce another package, and what I'm pushing for is another round of the Paycheck Protection Program for especially hard-hit businesses like many of our restaurants. The fact is that the average number of employees in a PPP loan in the state of Maine is seven. It has gone to our smallest businesses. We also need more funding for testing, more funding for our schools, and for the United States Postal Service. And Thank I would you. mention that I only got 30 Thank seconds on the first round when I should okay. have gotten a minute. Okay, we apologize. I think that probably is accurate. So I do apologize for that. Um, we're going to move on to the next question. This next question, um, you will have a minute. <laughs> um, and we don't have a follow-up to this one because we felt it was a very simple question that would just require the once through. Um, so uh, this one is coming from John uh, Small from WABI. Thank you, Kelly. This is a uh, question that was submitted by one of our viewers. Yvonne from Anson wants to know, would you support mandatory face masks? <laughs> And this question goes to Max Lynn first. Well, I think it's quite clear. I've been cutting the masks up here. This is an encroachment on our Constitution and our Bill of Rights and, and we as a free, independent people. But I can assure you, with Susan and Sarah, we can guarantee my mandatory masks are coming and mandatory vaccines because, as I said before, Sarah and Susan really have no say. They're, they're just the face plates of the Republican and Democratic Party and Maine viewers know that. They know that with, uh, with Susan and Sarah, all they get is the Republican and Democratic Party that's bankrupting this country, that's taking us so far away from our constitutional rights and our Bill of Rights. It's transforming our nation into something that's hard to even look at. With a, if Sarah and Susan were both in office, all we would see is their parties <coughs> running the show and what you're guaranteed is absolutely no change in Washington, D.C. with Susan or Sarah. The change is right here. Hey, thank you. Uh, Lisa Savage, your, question, your answer on this? Yes. Well, it's hard to answer the question without knowing what context the mandatory masks would be in. For instance, it's mandatory for us to be wearing clothing right now because we're out in public. Um, but I'm not wearing a mask because I'm far enough from other people. I came in wearing a mask and then I took it off. I think it really depends, again, on contest. It's a public health uh, requirement that masks be worn in indoor spaces where we can't <coughs> keep six feet of separation from us. Um, and also, it's uh, been clear as we learn more about this COVID-19 virus and how it's transmitted, we're starting to understand, oh, surfaces aren't as much of a risk as we thought they were. Um, it's really aerosols and droplets in interior spaces where we're closer than six feet together. So do I favor wearing masks? Yes, not only do masks protect others, which I'm willing to protect others, but they also protect us. So I think that wearing masks in certain situations is a good idea. Okay, Susan Collins. I believe that wearing masks is the considerate thing to do, and it does help to mitigate the spread of the disease. But I do not think that they should be mandatory by the federal government, because there are areas of Maine that have no COVID cases, like Piscataquis County. So perhaps mask wearing is not needed in most circumstances there. There are other parts of the state that have higher incidences. It can be fun to actually promote causes on your masks. Mine is eat Maine potatoes. <laughs> so I think you can have some fun with the masks and it is the right thing to do when you're in a crowd to protect the health of others as well as your health. Okay, and Sarah Gideon. Thank you for that question. You know, the 200,000 lives that we lost were somebody's mother or father, somebody's son or daughter, somebody's husband or wife. 
And the reason that that happened was because this president showed no leadership and in fact showed no honesty in misleading the American people. Imagine if we had actually taken this virus seriously from the very beginning. Imagine if we had leadership from the federal government about how to protect our public health, about how to reopen our economy safely, and guidance that didn't pressure public schools in going back to school, but actually helped set safety protocols to keep everyone safe. Look, we know from all public health guidance that is out there that masks are the most valuable tool that we have as individuals across this nation and across this globe to actually fight this pandemic. And what I would like to see us have is greater leadership from the federal level, both from the president and from Congress, who can step forward when, they, when the president doesn't. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you, candidates. We are going to move on to Ashley Blackford for our fourth question. What do you look for in, a next, in the next pandemic stimulus package? What will it take to get it passed? And this will go first to Lisa Savage. Yes, thank you for that question. Well, I would be looking for a meaningful bailout for people. Uh, most of the wealthy countries in the world gave significant payments to individuals to help them uh, cope with the pandemic loss of income. And um, I think that the U.S. is still waiting for that. I also feel that um, the next step in stimulus should be significant relief offered to states and municipalities. These are the government entities that provide direct services to people that are our most vulnerable populations. I think that they will be struggling, are struggling with a great loss of revenue um, uh, because of the pandemic recession. So I think that should be a huge uh, factor in any next stimulus package. As far as what it will take, to get one passed is <clears throat> putting the American people's needs first instead of thinking about the corporate donors that put you in Congress. I believe that's what it will take. All right, Senator Collins. We certainly need both sides to come together in the midst of this persistent pandemic and pass another package. Priorities for me include aid for our schools, I have talked to superintendents all over the state, visited schools in Holton and Hollis, and I've seen that they've had to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. We need to provide them with help. I support local aid, not just state aid, but local aid to prevent layoffs of our firefighters, our police officers, our sanitation crews our public works employees. We need, as I said, another round of PPP for especially hard hit businesses so that they can help uh, their employees. We need a reasonable supplement for federal unemployment compensation. And we need more funding for testing because testing is key to safely reopening our schools and our okay. economy. Thank you, Senator Collins. Speaker Gideon. Thank you. I just want to point out that it has been nearly five months since we have seen help from Congress related to coronavirus. The Senate has continued to bicker months after the House passed the HEROES Act. And in the meantime, we have families and working people waiting for more help. Here's what we need to focus on. Making sure that we get those help to families. That's in the form of food, uh, that's in the form of nutrition assistance, that is in the form of rental and mortgage assistance. It's also in the form of making sure that we protect and expand health care instead of trying to take it away. We need to make sure that more aid is coming to state, local, and tribal government. We additionally should think about hazard pay for our first responders. And those are the things that we need to continue to do in the short term while we are in this pandemic. But in the long term, we need an investment from the federal government in rural Maine and rural America. And that's going to include investments in broadband, in our infrastructure, our roads and bridges, making sure that we're able to have telehealth so that we have not only short-term jobs, but a long-term recovery. Thank you, Max Lynn, your minute. Well, thank you. Well, that leads to better or late than never, but at my website that's never been seen in American politics before, it's the Converter website, I cover all these issues. It's at maxlinforsenate.com, and during the first debate I brought it up, we had over 100,000 hits and shut it down, but now we've tested it and it can take over a million at one time. But you know, this debate up here with Sarah and Susan sort of reminded me of a Saturday Night Live skit with these two comedians respectfully saying what they believe in when in fact they only do what they're told to do by the party leadership. I know that the relief 
Susan's talking about, the PPP, was written by corporate America. That's who it benefits. My relief plan calls for a $5,000 direct to relief to every Maine family, a $500 billion bailout nationwide for businesses only with under 100 employees. That's a people direct bailout. And of course, student loan forgiveness. That's not creating money, it's forgiving a debt. Thank you, Max Lynn. Lisa Savage, you have 30 additional seconds on this question. <clears throat> yes, I do think that the chronic underfunding of our public schools is also an issue that could be addressed in uh, the next pandemic relief bill. Um, I have been defunded many times as a public school teacher. When our schools were asked to reopen, still in the midst of a public health crisis, they did receive some relief, but I think a great deal more could be done to ensure the safety of students, staff that are working there, and to be able to th have them make the physical plant changes that need to be made to conduct school safely. Thank you, Lisa Savage. Senator Collins, your additional 30 seconds of rebuttal. Sarah is in a position of leadership in the state. What did she do? She adjourned the legislature. She's had virtually no discussion with Republicans to get them back to work on a coronavirus bill. She promised help to small business, said she would provide help immediately. In April, she's done nothing. Thank you, Senator Collins. Sarah Gideon, your 30-second rebuttal. Sure, thank you. Well, look, Senator Collins continues to deflect from the real issue at hand here, the fact that states, states like Maine, municipalities all over are on the verge of making terrible cuts because we are waiting for more help from the federal government. Look, the reality is we are in a public health crisis. We need, number one, to take care and prioritize our public health, something that is still not happening as we're not even manufacturing enough PPE in this nation to actually manage the supply chain. Thank you, Sarah Gideon. We'll move on to Max Lynn for the last 30 seconds on this question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Well, we look at the situation. If we notice, I've been calling Sarah and Susan out all evening, and they won't even look at me. They won't question me. They won't ever debate me. These women are weak candidates, weak women. There's a lot of strong women in politics. I'm sure if Hillary Clinton was sitting there, she'd take me on. I'm sure if Elizabeth Warren or even Janet Mills was sitting across from me, she'd take me on. But I don't think we need weak leadership in Washington. And Susan and Sarah are the Thank perfect you. example of that. Thank you, Max Lynn. Very much. And with that, we are going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. I voted for Susan Collins multiple times in the past, but she has made my choice very easy in this election. I think Susan Collins continues to protect the insurance companies. Well, she's cast votes that, that have not helped us get affordable medication. I think if Susan Collins 24 years ago saw where Susan Collins is today, she would be very disappointed, as many of us are. I would never vote for her again. I'm Sarah Gideon, and I approve this message. I'm Susan Collins, and I've approved this message. Working people depend on our cars and trucks. And in my budget, every dollar counts. But Sarah Gideon wants to raise taxes on gas and diesel. Gideon's gas tax would raise gas prices 40 cents a gallon. That's an extra 10 bucks with every fill-up. It's a bad idea that's bad for Maine. Higher fuel taxes hurt Maine workers, our farmers, and our families. Maine can't afford Sarah Gideon. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. We're going to move into our individual questions for the candidates, and we're going to begin with Senator Susan Collins. Ashley Blackford will be asking it. This viewer question is from Ryan Haynes from Fort Fairfield. He asks, over 20 years ago, Susan Collins pledged to only serve two terms if elected. She stated that 12 years was long enough to make a contribution in public office. I would like to know why she broke that pledge to her constituents and is continuing as a career senator. <laughs> and Senator Collins, you have one minute. Thank you. I have learned in the Senate just how important seniority is. It has given me the clout to help communities 
throughout our state. It is not a coincidence that Maine ranks number one on a per capita basis in the amount of transportation funding from the BUILD program that has provided funding for bridges and roads and seaports, airports all over our state. That's because I am the chair of the Transportation Appropriations Subcommittee. It is not a coincidence that Bath Ironworks was able to get two additional uh, ships funded that the Navy wanted, but that were not included in the President's budget. That's because I'm a member of the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee. So it's through my seniority that Thank I've you. been able to Thank do you so much, much for the state I love. Thank you. All right, we'll now go to Sarah Gideon's individual candidate question. And for that, we'll turn to John Small in Bangor. Uh, when the pandemic hit, the legislature stopped sessions for months. Do you think it should have done something different? Would you handle it differently now? John, thank you for that question. And in fact, we did adjourn the legislature when COVID-19 hit, but not before making sure that we swiftly came together to pass legislation and to make sure that the governor had the tools that she needed in order to be able to deal with this health care emergency. And I do want to say that I am very proud of the fact that here in Maine, we have one of the two lowest COVID infection rates in the entire country. Now, as you may know, we did continue to do work in the legislature. The president, uh, the Senate and I convened all legislative committees that had more work to do to finish their work. And we had 74% of bipartisan reports coming out of those committees. We also did attempt to recall the legislature. Unfortunately, our colleagues were unwilling to do that. Now, as we look towards the future, what we know is that we, again, need more help from the federal government to make sure that we are prioritizing public health and that we are helping people get back on their feet through the course of this pandemic. Thank okay. you. Uh, Max Lynn, Ashley Blackford has your question. Now, as an independent candidate that has come out in support of President Donald Trump and shares values with the Republican Party, are you concerned that by running in this race, you may take votes away from Susan Collins in favor of candidate Sarah Gideon? Uh, no, I do not. I plan on winning, and I really don't want to leave this to the judges. I want to win by 50, over 50 percent, and that will send a message not only to Washington, but the entire United States that man is, Maine is fed up with the careerism of Susan and Sarah. This is like, I listen to these answers that Sarah and Susan give, and I just rank it as like the number one bullshit. Susan broke her promise on term limits. I'll pledge term limits two terms, and I'll tell you what, I'll see, sign lead, legal papers that say my entire net worth is donated to hospice. That's what needs to be done. Susan acts like she's so important. I'm sure she's a very nice woman, but her time has come to move on. The graveyards of America are filled with irreplaceable be, uh, people. The graveyards are filled with irreplaceable people. Yet Susan sits here and says, she's irreplaceable. All right, we apologize. The clock was started late on that one, so that is your minute, but thank you very much. Well, we get cut off on that one, okay. All right, let's go there to our go. next question to Lisa Savage, and it'll come from John Small out of the Bangor studio. Thank you, J Jason. Given that this is a ranked choice voting election, as an independent candidate that shares values with the Democratic Party, are you concerned that by running in this race, race you may take votes away from Sarah Gideon in favor of candidate Susan Collins? Thank you. I'm not at all concerned about taking votes away from Sarah Gideon in a ranked choice voting election. Ranked choice voting allows the voters to express the values that they hold, and rather than making a negative vote against a candidate that they don't want, they can choose the candidate that best speaks to their values, what they'd like to see as their first ranking, without any fear of spoiling the election, and then they can go on to the candidate that's next closest and make and uh, you know rank that person number two so in a ranked choice voting election here in maine with these four candidates i think there's very little um, uh, danger of my pulling votes sarah gideon and i have very different platforms she does not support medicare for all she does not support a green new deal and she does not support getting money out of politics she's taken tens of millions of dollars to run her campaign. I'm the only non-millionaire up here, and if people want to see those kind of values represented in the Senate, they should definitely rank me first and then 
vote blue number two. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. We're gonna, now going to switch back to some general candidate questions. Now, in order to get through a few additional questions, we will give each candidate one minute to respond and then move on to the next question. Any rebuttal will be at the moderator's discretion. And Ashley, you have the first question. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Sarah from Blue Hill asks, what would you do to support and save the United States Postal Service? And we'll start this round with Senator Susan Collins. I'm very glad to get this question because I have introduced a bill with Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein from California that would provide an emergency appropriation for the U.S. Postal Service. This is so important because the Postal Service has incurred billions of dollars in unexpected costs in order to comply with the COVID restrictions. After all, postal workers are frontline workers. In addition, marketing revenue, advertising revenue has plummeted for the Postal Service. I've been successful in negotiating already an agreement that a $10 billion loan would be converted to a grant for the Postal Service and I'm hopeful that we can finish the job. The Postal Service is an absolutely essential institution, Thank you. especially Thank you. for rural Sarah America. Sarah Gideon, your response? Thank you very much. You know, I agree with Senator Collins that the Postal Service is absolutely essential. And I want to emphasize that it is a service and it is especially important in rural America where we have people like veterans who are waiting, especially while they can't get their medication at TOGUS, for that prescription medication to come in the mail, while we see seniors waiting for that same thing. And we've seen documented delays because of this Postmaster General DeJoy and the decisions that he has made. Look, I think this is a situation where, again, we see Senator Collins saying what she wish would happen or what she co-sponsors, and yet she is not using her seniority to actually get results for Mainers or for America in this case. There is no question that in the short term, in the seconds are ticking away, the United States Postal Service needs more money and more appropriations. But additionally, we need to remove that pre-funding mandate that has put the Postal Service into debt. We have seen Republican and Democratic senators and independents, including our own Angus King, make the decision to stand much. by that. Uh, Max Lynn? And this is what I mean. What a softball question. Let's pay a few extra cents for our stamp and keep the post office. What do I want to address is the real issues. We have a pandemic situation that the government is overreaching their boundaries, number one. We have riots in the inner city and our country's going bankrupt because of Sarah and Susan. They're going bankrupt. What these two represent is the gigantic Republican Party and gigantic Democratic Party. And let me show you something here. I talked to both of them. Neither one of them will look at me or address me back, neither one. And I think we need strong leadership in Washington. And unfortunately, Sarah and Susan are the definitions of weak leadership. They've paid their dues. It's time, we're in the bottom of the ninth, we need a grand slam, and they sure aren't gonna hit it. They won't even address me, they won't challenge me up here in front of you. How in the heck are they gonna challenge the real issues in Washington, D.C.? Okay, thank you, Lisa Savage. Yes, thank you. Well, a very bad law was passed requiring the U.S. Postal Service to fund their retiree pension out 75 years. That is a requirement that no other service or company or corporation or federal uh, agency has to meet, and that is the source of the U.S. Postal Service financial woes. I do think that Postmaster General DeJoy needs to go. Removing sorting machines and stripping them for parts in an election season is unconscionable. And I also know from talking to people around me that seniors waiting for medication that comes to them by mail are having to go without necessary medication that they need to maintain their health. That is not fair. The U.S. Postal Service is a very important service where I live in Solon, Maine. Many things come to us via the post office that we would not get from private carriers. It, it, they wouldn't want to do it. It wouldn't be cost effective to do. So we need to save our U.S. Postal Service. Okay, thank you. And Senator Collins, you were mentioned by Sarah Gideon. Would you like to respond? I would just point out that I have been the leader in the Senate on postal issues. I've introduced the bill for the emergency appropriation. It has been 
endorsed by several postal groups. And it is because the Postal Service is so important in a state like ours. As has been pointed out, there are seniors who rely on the Postal Service for prescriptions. People get needed checks in the mail. They, it is an important institution. Thank you And I much. have been successful because I've already gotten okay, the you. treasury to agree um, to convert a loan. Sarah to Gideon, you were mentioned by Max Lynn. Did you want to respond to that? Uh, Over here, Sarah, why don't you say something to me for the first time? Woman up. Uh, it's not your time, sir. Sorry. Please yep. move on, Sarah Sorry. Gideon. Yep. Thank you very much for that, for that opportunity. Uh, the only request I have is actually that we do not allow people to swear on the stage because I do know that there are many children watching our debate tonight. <laughs> All right, thank you. We will now move on to our next question, question six. That comes from John in our Bangor studio. Thank you, Jason. Another question from a viewer, Josh from Skowhegan, wants to know, healthcare costs, prescription costs are too high. What will you do to lower them? And we'll start first on this question with Sarah Gideon. Thank you so much for that question, John. Absolutely, healthcare costs are too high and prescription drug costs. And as we know, people are making terrible choices. They're forced to make those choices every day about seeing a doctor or buying their medicine. I met with a man named uh, Jeffrey who told me that he was so grateful for the Affordable Care Act because as somebody who was self-employed, that was what allowed him to buy insurance for his family. His wife Dana subsequently was diagnosed with breast cancer and they were so thankful that, for that insurance. And yet we see the Republicans across the country trying to take that health care away with that vote or decision that's going to be made in the Supreme Court starting a week after Election Day. I would do exactly the opposite, making health care stronger, making sure that anybody who wants to is able to buy into Medicare through a public option, making Medicare stronger so that we could actually have the U.S. government negotiate with pharmaceutical companies to lower the cost of drugs and make sure that everyone has thank the health care that is you. a basic human right. Thank you, Speaker Gideon. Uh, Max Lynn. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's very clear that we need a private and public combination, which I've always talked about. And what we're not going to get from Sarah or Susan is any medical reform because they don't have any say. If one of them are in office, they just go to a committee. All the power goes to, in Sarah's case, it all goes to Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. And in Susan's case, it goes to uh, Mitch McConnell. And do you think they care anything about Portland? Absolutely. Do you think they care anything about rural Maine? Not a chance. The only meaningful reform in, in medical health care and health insurance is with me. What they never talk about is what we need in combining the hybrid, which is a public and combination private, but we need tort reform and we need infrastructure so we can bring telemedicine to the rural communities. These two candidates combined have been in Maine politics and elected office for almost 50 years. What are either one of them going to do that they haven't done in their combined 50 years? Thank you, Max Lynn. Lisa Savage, your minute. Thank you. Um, I'm one of those people that believes that the word profit and healthcare don't even belong in the same sentence together. Not every human activity is appropriate for profit making, and healthcare should not be a commodity. It should be a human right that is guaranteed to all in this wealthiest country in the history of the world. Making the Unaffordable Care Act more affordable with a public option is not good enough. That will not solve the problem of the families of the students that I worked with uh, as a school teacher for 25 years. My plan for Medicare for All is the solution that we need. It is single payer universal health care, and if voters agree, they can rank me first to indicate that they want Medicare for All. I know that a majority of Mainers have said health care is right up at the top of their list of concerns, and a majority of people nationwide have said they want Medicare for All. So ranking me first would be the best way for Maine voters to get universal health care in place. Thank you, Lisa Savage. Senator Collins, you have the last minute. I have already passed two laws to help lower the cost of prescription drugs. One of them allows your local pharmacist to give you advice on the least expensive way to purchase your drug. That has made a big difference. The other created an expedited approval for lower cost but equally effective generic drugs 
that has led to 44 generic drugs coming to the marketplace much more quickly. More needs to be done. I have co-sponsored a bill that would put a cap on the out-of-pocket costs of seniors that would save them $72 billion over the next 10 years. I've also co-sponsored a bill that would put a cap on the price of insulin, not just for a few, but for anyone, no matter what their uh, plan or whether they're even Thank uninsured. Thank you, Senator Collins. Also, we need Thank you very Thank much. You, Senator Collins. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, Ashley Blackford has this one. Now, many parts of the state are experiencing drought conditions. Aroostook County was actually just designated as a primary natural disaster area. What will you do to bring aid to farmers who are struggling? And Max Lynn, this goes first to you. Well, thank you. Uh, I, th I think I stand alone up here as far as an environmental and wildlife, uh, that there's nothing more precious than wildlife and taking care of rural Maine. That's why Sarah and Susan have no impact up here because the legislation they'll sponsor if they were in office and after this election they won't be because I'll be there. But what you get is the Democratic and Republican Party and these laws are written by the big multi-billion dollar companies and then they're handed down to people like Sarah or Susan if they were in office and then they just write the laws and put their names on it. The people in rural Maine will never be represented by Mitch McConnell, Nancy Pelosi, or Chuck Schumer. And that's exactly what you're going to get with Sarah or Susan in office. With me in office, you'll get someone who's lived in rural Maine, who's made Maine the focus of my entire life. Okay, thank you. Lisa Savage? Yes. Um, well, my Green New Deal plan includes regenerative agriculture, which means farming practices that uh, improve the soil and improve farms rather than depleting them. The aroostook potato farmers are suffering from the drought. Farmers across the state are suffering from a drought caused by climate change. A Green New Deal would address climate crisis by investing in clean energy systems and in public transportation to mitigate the effects of uh, driving and putting a lot of greenhouse gases into the air. And I think that um, definitely if people in Maine know that we need a Green New Deal to respond to climate emergency like it's an emergency, the Gulf of Maine is also warming faster than any other body of water in the world's oceans, and that's hurting our fisheries. Maine voters can rank me first to indicate that they understand that I know that climate is an emergency and that a Green New Deal would help farmers, it would help our fishers, and it would help uh, all of us with the okay. effects of climate Thank change. Thank you very much. Su uh, Susan Collins? This is the driest year that Aroostook County has had in more than 130 years. Other parts of our state, Washington County, Penobscot, parts of York, have also been affected by this drought. And I've already urged the Secretary of Agriculture to declare a disaster in Maine, and he has already done so. I was talking to a potato farmer who told me that unless you have the irrigation, your crop is going to be in real trouble. A blueberry grower told me the same thing. And that's why I'm glad that at my request, USDA has stepped up with a disaster relief program that will help cover lost production and other expenses of our farmers and our growers. It's absolutely imperative. Okay, thank you, Sarah Gideon. Thank you very much for this question. This morning, actually, I was at Edgecombe Farm in Limestone with a farmer named Fred, who is in a sixth generation farm, potato farming. And we looked at the yield that they're getting. It is very low and the potatoes are smaller. And the reason is absolutely climate change. We see it in these record hot summers. We see it in these droughts. And we have to attack the root of the problem. We can do that in a whole number of ways, but it's going to include bold and immediate action around lowering our carbon emissions and increasing our renewable energy generation. We need to make sure we're thinking about doing that in transparency transforming our transportation industry, our energy industry, and even our building industry. But farmers also need short-term help. And that's why we need to look at programs like how we can help 
drought resilience, how we can also think about programs like insurance for disaster relief in terms of extreme weather related to climate change, or insurance for crops for small farmers. We need short-term and long-term okay, help. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move on to one more question. We're gonna allow 40 seconds for a response on this one so we can ensure that we get closing statements in. Uh, it's a question that will be asked by John Small from Bangor. Thank you, another important industry in our region. Loggers are also struggling, no aid provided to them yet. What will you do to help that industry? In 40 seconds first, Elisa Savage. Well, I know that many people in Maine still make their living from the woods and many of the families that I've worked with as a public school teacher for years uh, have been hurt by the closing of mills and the reduction of uh, a market for their wood products. I do know also many uh, sustainable forestry practices that are being used to um, support logging and support people still being able to make their living from the woods. I think it's a great main tradition that I would hate to see go away. Again, addressing climate change with a Green New Deal is the most significant way that we could support our forests and the people who make a living from them. Thank you, Lisa Savage. Senator Collins. With the loss of a market at the J Mill due to the explosion there, our loggers are really hurting. And that's why I've introduced a bipartisan bill in the Senate to provide the kind of assistance to our loggers that I was successful in securing for our fishermen. It is absolutely imperative in order to keep the whole supply chain in our forest products industry going. And never forget that our forest products industry is still the number one employer in this state. Thank you, Sarah Gideon. Thank you very much for that question. Yes, the forest products industry is a $7 billion industry, and it is also a way of life, whether we're thinking about loggers or beyond that. And we need to think towards the future, something that we have not been able to do. Yes, it's true, we do have residuals piling up, and that is a major problem. Loggers need short-term relief. We also need to make sure that there are fair trade practices involved. But we need to do more than that. We need to look towards the future and think about biofuels and bio-based um, products that we can actually produce and how we can support research and development in order to bring us into the future. And Max Lynn, you get the last word on this one. Thank you so much. Realize Maine right now is the most powerful state in the country and you, the Maine voter, is the most powerful voter in the country. That's why Susan and Sarah's paymasters are spending upwards of $100 million to buy your vote. But if either of them end up in the Senate, all the, the leverage, all the influence and power leaves Maine and it goes to Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, or the Republican Party and they don't give a damn about rural Maine. You know that and I know that. On the other hand, with a victory right here, Maine becomes the most powerful state in the country because either party, Democrat or Republican, has to come through the filters of Maine to get things done and that's what will help rural Maine. All right, thank you very much. Well, as our debate winds to a close, we will now have each candidate give their closing statements. Each candidate will have one minute, and we begin with Senator Susan Collins. It's harvest time in Arusa, and that brings back memories of picking potatoes as a young girl. We learned to keep our commitment to our farmers, and just as I have kept my commitment to the people of Maine, to work hard and to act with integrity. I grew up in Caribou and for the past 26 years, I've lived in Bangor. I love this state and my seniority has benefited our communities. In Washington County, I secured funding to make our fishermen safer. In Hancock, a new training ship for Maine Maritime Academy. In Aroostook, Piscataquis, and Waldo counties, funding for rail and bridges to save jobs. In Penobscot, waterfront projects in Bangor and Brewer. In Kennebec and, and Aroostook, new Thank community you. college programs Thank to you. train workers. Thank you, Senator Collins. Don't buy the Thank lies. You. You Thank you. It's it's now time Thank you. We're running really Sarah tight. Gideon. Sarah Gideon, one minute. Thank you very much for tuning in. You know, my earliest memories were of trailing my dad through the hospital while he was making his rounds, or being in the waiting room cleaning up the books and magazines and listening to him talk to patients. 
My dad was a pediatrician. My mother was an RN who then became a mental health professional. And what they taught me was that healthcare and taking care of others was the most important thing in the world. That's why when I had that d choice in front of me to run for public office for Freeport Town Council all those years ago, I decided that that was how I was going to make a difference in people's lives. Unfortunately, it's not what we see happening in Washington because special interests are coming in front of the interests of us as individuals and of our families. We see health care being threatened to take away right now. Look, as a senator, I will be focused on what matters for us. That means making sure that more people and everyone has access to health care that they can afford, bringing down the cost of drugs, and fighting climate change, just like I've done thank, here in the state of Maine. Thank you very much, Sarah Gideon. Max Lynn. Thank you. I want to speak directly to the families of Maine who, have felt, who feel like they've been left behind by our political class in Washington, D.C. While you have struggled, you've had your jobs taken away, your family members have overdosed on Chinese-made drugs, you've had your civil liberties thrown out the window worrying how you're going to make ends meet. They voted their pals in the big corporations all the benefits. They got multi-billion dollar bailouts with civil unrest in our cities and economic unrest in our bank accounts. The actions of those in the political class have shown us one thing. They don't give a damn about you, your families, or your way of life. But I do. I have no allegiance to their paymasters in the political class. Ranking me first in this race is a way to push back against those who have sold your families down the river time and time again. Ranking me first is a way to tell the political class in Washington, D.C. to go to hell. Stand for the main workers' ticket. Thank you, Max. I vote for Donald Trump, Max. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Thank you very much. Lisa, Lisa Savage. Savage. I'm grateful for everyone who made tonight possible and very grateful for everyone watching from home. Mainers are independent thinkers. They fought hard for right choice voting and we had that reform so that we can lead the way for the nation. Everyone is watching this election because of ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting is also about how candidates earn your ranking. It's um, a way of showing your values by the candidate that you pick. I'm the only non-millionaire in this race and the only one that will not be looking out for wealthy people in the Senate, but will be looking out for regular Mainers with Medicare for All, fighting for a Green New Deal, and making rich people pay their fair share of taxes. I've been paying 28% tax rate as a school teacher married to a woodworker. We need to stop funding endless wars, which are basically corporate welfare, making money for big corporations. My website is lisafermain.org if you want more info, and I will be on social media answering questions immediately after the debate. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And that is going to wrap up our 2020 senatorial debate. Thank you to all of the candidates for participating, and a big thank you to WABI and the Heuristic Partnership for partnering with us on it. To voters out there, make sure you get out and do your civic duty before or on November 3rd. This debate will be available online at WAGMTV.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful night.